Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Oregon Sea Grant's Career in Science Investigations webinar series. This is the second of many webinars intended to connect students like yourself with marine science professionals. My name is Lindsay Carroll, and I am the Marine Education Coordinator with Oregon Sea Grant, and I traditionally coordinate education programming at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center. Hatfield is unfortunately closed right now, which is why we are bringing education opportunities to you virtually. During today's webinar, you are encouraged to ask questions of our presenters. You may do so by using the question and answer function labeled Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You may ask the question at any time, and we will try to do our best to get to as many questions after each presenter as time permits. Before we get started, we want to learn more about you. We have two poll questions. So I'm gonna have Kate Goodwin, our special projects coordinator, launch the first question which asks you to tell us what grade you're in. So, Kate, okay, go ahead and launch that poll. Please take a few seconds to let us know if you're in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, or if you're an adult or a parent. We have about 75% of people who have voted so far. Few more seconds to let folks vote. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. Thank you, Kate. All right, it looks like we don't have any elementary schoolers. We have 39% of you are in middle school. 22% are in high school, 9% are in college, and we have 30% adults, very cool. All right, so now we're going to launch a poll to get to know where you're joining us from. So are you joining us from Oregon, the West Coast, a states not Oregon, the Central US, East Coast, or are you joining us from outside the US? We're about up to 75% again. Ooh, 77% have voted. And we will end the poll. Thank you, Kate. All right, so it looks like 65% of you are from Oregon, 12% are from the West Coast, there are 12% from the Central US, and 12% from the East Coast. No outside the US, but maybe next time. <laughs> All right. So thank you for sharing a little bit more of information about you. Now it's time to hear from our first speaker, Jamie Ivory. Jamie is a research assistant that works in the plankton ecology lab at Hatfield Marine Science Center. She's gonna tell you about what it's like to study plankton, those essential critters at the base of the food chain. So Jamie, you may now share your screen and begin your presentation. Great, thank you. Thanks for having me, Lindsay. Can you guys see the screen? I can see it. Yes. Great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome to everyone who's tuning in. I'm so glad to take a few minutes to um, talk to you about uh, my work as a plankton ecologist. I'm a faculty research assistant at Oregon State University, which is a fancy um, title for a lab tech or a lab manager. Now I wanna spend a little bit of time on my background and how I got to where I am today. I uh, grew up in, there we go. I grew up in Pennsylvania um, in a very rural, rural area. It's a landlocked state, so I wasn't close to the ocean by any means, but I always, um, uh, loved animals and science and uh, had an interest in marine biology. Uh, I went to college at Humboldt State University and uh, I majored there in biology with a marine em emphasis and I uh, minored in scientific diving. Uh, 
I was a little nervous to pursue a major in something that I was told was a very competitive field, uh, but I had mentors that suggested that I gain experience and in internships as frequently as possible. So every summer, I participated in some kind of internship. My first was at the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium. My second was at College of William and Mary, where I was building um, an apparatus to grow algae to uh, then use as that harvested algae as a biofuel. And then I also did a research experience for undergraduate students um, in Alabama, which also took me to Bermuda for some of that work. After um, college, I found that I really, really enjoyed uh, zooplankton in particular from my work and ended up going to graduate school for a master's degree in marine science at Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And, uh, and there I, I really, really found my love and my niche in zooplankton research. So before I get into um, what zooplankton are, I want to get some of our audience members to participate in another pool. So this is a real or imagined, and I'm going to ask you of these three organisms, are they real or are they imagined? Number one, we have a 100 foot long sea creature was discovered living off the coast of Australia. It makes whale sharks look super tiny and even a blue whale look small in comparison. Is this real or imagined? Then we have number two, alien. This is a predatory creature that uses a host body as protection and food source for its young. Is this a real creature uh, that inspired our sci-fi thriller Alien, or is it imagined? And then we have number three. This little one will, look, may look cute and delicate, but when it's all grown up, it's a monster of the deep. Would you say that that's real or imagined? Go ahead and and cast your votes. We got a lot of votes coming in. You can vote for number one, number two, and number three, real or imagined. Up to about 75%. Should we end the poll? Everyone made their choice. Awesome. All right, so number one, 69% said real, and 31% said imagined. Number two, alien, 54% said real, and 46% said imagined. And then our little guy, number three, 77% said real, and 23% said imagined. So this was a bit of a trick question. They're all actually real organisms. So starting with number one, if you guys haven't heard, this was pretty breaking news recently, a siphonophore was discovered living off the coast of Australia, which is 150 feet long. A siphonophore is related to cnidarians, and it is a type of zooplankton. Um, a common siphonophore that we see washed up on our ocean, on our beaches here in Oregon, is the by the wind sailors, the Valella Valella. So you may recognize those if you're local. And then the really famous siphonophore that maybe everyone else can relate to as well is the Portuguese man o' war, which we see down here. Number two, our alien. Yes, uh, the sci-fi creature alien was actually inspired by a real zooplankton called Phrenema. Phrenema uses its host, a salp, to eat the inside of the host and then leave the shell, which it uses to have its eggs inside and then raise its young in a protected casing. And number three, our little guy here, which you can see in real form, has these crazy stocked eyes 
and looks very delicate and cute, but whenever it's an adult, it becomes quite the deep sea monster. But thank goodness it is still tiny. So this is the size of a sample that I collected in the Pacific, the dragonfish. So what are, are zooplankton? They're animals that drift in our oceans or freshwater currents. They can do their drifters because they could be too small, like you, you see these copepods here. These are really, really beautiful uh, parasitic copepods um, to jellyfish, in fact. Or they're drifting in the currents because they just aren't strong enough, like the famous jellyfish, or perhaps you don't know too much about the pyrosome here, which can get quite large as well. And we often see those drift up on our beaches, um, also known as sea pickles. Oops, sorry. <laughs> so um, some zooplankton spend their entire lives as zooplankton drifting in the currents, like we see this little copepod here, which um, they are quite small as well. Uh, here is a sample of just copepods in them. They're about the size of a grain of rice. And then we have krill in the middle, which are famous for feeding our whales and they can get to be about this size here. And then we also have things like worms, like this worm over here. Some animals only spend a portion of their lives as zooplankton, like crabs and lobster. You can see the baby lobster here and the baby crab here. Both go through quite a transformation, become the adults that we love to eat. Also fish, spend a portion of their lives as zooplankton. Here are baby rockfish, which you can see the adult there. And here is an adult billfish, but you can see whenever it's a baby, it is super duper tiny. So why do we study zooplankton? Aside from them being really, really cool to do um, on a personal basis, there's also some really big questions that are important that zooplankton can answer or do. So zooplankton are pivotal to our food webs. If we don't have zooplankton, we don't have any of our higher, more charismatic animals like um, turtles and whales and sharks. So zooplankton uh, eat our plants in the ocean and then they themselves are a major food source to our larger animals like fish and whales. You can see a krill here and this is a baleen whale which feasts on these little guys. They're also pivotal to something called the biological pump. And this is a process that explains how they play, how the ocean plays a part in um, our atmospheric carbon dioxide budget. So carbon dioxide is taken in through the surface waters through mixing with waves and wind. And phytoplankton take that carbon dioxide up in photosynthesis, and then they can multiply and grow. Zooplankton, as I said before, eat phytoplankton, the plants of the sea. And because they're animals, they do something all animals do, which is uh, poop. And then they also do grow old and occasionally die. When these animals do both of those things, the, um, the poop and the carcasses can sink deep into the ocean. And if they do make it to sink deep in the ocean, that keeps that carbon source from entering into the atmosphere again. It can stay there deep for millions of years, which lowers the atmospheric carbon dioxide. So we understand why they're important to study. How do we collect zooplankton? We do it with the old fashioned net system that's been done in oceanography for decades. Um, but we have made some improvements to our net systems. We have multiple nets on one frame. We also have lots of sensors that give us oceanographic information like salinity, temperature, depth, and things like that, instead of just a net in the water. We also use scientific diving. We'll use this method to collect um, delicate animals like these gelatinous organisms here. Uh, we want to collect them when they're, um, you know, not damaged from net systems. So we'll collect them that way if we want to have experiments with live animals and we don't want them to be damaged. And then we're also getting into some really cool cutting edge technology like this uh, tow behind underwater camera system. This tows behind a ship and it takes a picture of every zooplankton that flows through its camera 
And, uh, and it also has sensors that tells you the depth, temperature, oxygen levels, salinities, and things like that. So every picture of a zooplankton has the ecological um, fingerprint of that that animal was living in. So what do I do on a day-to-day -day basis when I'm at work? A lot of my work is done in the lab. Um, I spend a lot of time picking out um, these super duper cute little larval fish, um, IDing them and counting them. Uh, a lot of the time I'm listening to podcasts or rocking out to some tunes. So it's a really nice way to pass the day. Also as a lab manager, I'm in charge of making sure that lab supplies are stocked and ordering those and also preparing for our field work. For field work, we do occasionally do scientific diving like I talked about before, but a majority of our field work is done out on large scale research vessels. This will be on a research vessel for weeks, sometimes months at a time. And this is really, really a ton of fun. Um, we get to really branch out of our normal aspect of day to day work. We're doing almost construction kind of work. Um, we're getting wet and working with the nets. Um, working with the samples to preserve them so that we can then take them back to the lab and do our processing and IDing. <clears throat> so what kinds of questions do plankton ecologists study and where do we get to go to do that, those kinds of studies? So this is like a really, really cool perk of the job. Zooplankton are found all over the world, so that means our research can take us all over the world. We can, of course, stay close to home like this project here that I'm working on currently is off the coast of Oregon in Northern California. And we're looking at how something called upwelling impacts the lower food web. I've also done work off in Japan. I've been there for two months doing um, small boat work. So it's just going out for the day and coming back. And we were trying to determine how zooplankton mortality is changing at different sites throughout, throughout Japan in relation to different population levels of human and um, that interaction. <coughs> um, then I did some work off of Mexico in San Diego, which was looking at how zooplankton responded to different oxygen levels. <coughs> and I've also done some work down in the South Pacific um, in American Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, and New Zealand. Where I was working as a plankton ecologist and teaching undergraduate students how to do general oceanography, um, just sampling in general. And the coolest part was that it was on board a tall ship. So it was a very romantic idea of bringing together old time travel um, with really cool cutting edge technology. Since zooplankton are found in both saltwater and freshwater, I've done work on the Great Lakes as part of a decadal time series. And I've also done work um, on much larger time series scales that, that bring in um, chemical oceanographers and physical oceanographers, as well as us biological oceanographers, all coming together to answer really, really big questions like that biological pump and figuring out the ocean's carbon budget. <clears throat> so this work was done off of Bermuda. And then I also got to participate in a study like that that was done in Antarctica. And so with that, I want to make sure that I left um, time for questions and also included some fun Antarctica videos for you all. Uh, so if anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much, Jamie. I love that penguin. Um, we have a question from Eli about how did the internships help you get ahead in the field, specifically related to like connections, experience, et cetera? Great, thanks. That's a really good question, Eli. Yeah, it's really, really important to have those experiences and the connections for sure. Um, so, you know, uh, my first year working at the zoo got me that like, work experience that made me <laughs> attractive to the College of William and Mary internship. And then completely unknowing, um, I got my REU position. I was, I kind of jumped at, out of the pile as an applicant because I had been to College of William and Mary and the professor that was hiring um, had been a College of William and Mary alumni. So that, that was like a weird way that that kind of helped 
me. Of course, you know, my, my education and my um, CV backed me up, my resume, but that kind of helped uh, me just pop from the pile. So you never really know how all of that can, can help you. Um, but I would just recommend always saying yes to opportunities uh, because another thing that those internships did was help me learn what I actually liked. So I, in undergrad, I didn't think I would like being out at sea. I wanted to be in the water all the time, um, but I actually loved being out at sea when I got a chance to go. So that also helps you figure out who you want to be and what kind of a career you want. Fantastic. Thanks, Jamie. We have a question from Lauren about what is your favorite type of plankton? Ooh, that's a good question, Lauren. Um, I think my favorite type might be that uh, parasitic copepod that I showed, uh, the sapphirina. They're just really, really beautiful, just eye-popping beautiful. And I had been working on samples that had them in the preserved samples, but preservation takes the color out of them. So when I got to see them live, I just saw this, like it looked like glitter in the water sample. And I was like, what is that? And I put it under the scope and was just blown away that this was this animal that I saw over and over and over again. And I had no idea how beautiful it was when it was alive. Great, so this is a good one from Hannah. What college degree would you recommend our participants have to get into your position? Yeah, so you definitely need a bachelor's degree um, if you want to work in academia as a lab tech. Uh, a master's degree um, <clears throat> helps kind of get you that experience, and um, but you can also gain that experience through internships and jobs along the way after a bachelor's degree. The only thing that would be different um, is that um, usually a bachelor's degree only, you'll be stuck at a certain uh, promotion topping. You won't be able to go so far in promotions where if you had a master's degree, you can kind of continue to grow potentially that you couldn't with just a bachelor's. Great insights, Jamie. One last quick question um, is how much time do you spend on land versus on a ship? Sure. Um, so there was one year where I spent six months at sea and six months on land. Uh, but most of the time now it's more like a, a month out, um, like uh, before the COVID-19 in this past year, I would have been out to sea for uh, probably two months total over the year. Very good. All right. So thank you, Jamie. Uh, for your wonderful presentation and thank you everyone for your great questions. Uh, Jamie's going to go ahead and uh, see if she can answer some of those other questions, but we also want to make sure that everyone is engaged with our next presenter. Um, it's uh, OSU's resident shark guy, Dr. Taylor Chappell. He's going to tell us how he uses technology to gain insight into shark behavior and how he got to be where he is today. So Taylor, go ahead and share your screen and begin your presentation. There we go. Can you guys hear me now? Um, thanks. Thanks for having me. And thanks, Jamie, for teaching us a bit about plankton. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the other end. Actually, let me get myself in, in proper shape here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so as Lindsay said, I, um, I study uh, sharks and I study the movements and behaviors of big animals. And I'm new at OSU. I started just a few months ago. Um, and so what I wanted to do is <clears throat> take this opportunity to talk about some of the um, animals that I study, some of the technology that I use, and the types of questions that I answer and that, that, I, that I try to answer. Um, and one of the big things is, is what I try to do in my role is to change the way that we think about animals. And many of you probably have these ideas of what a, a shark is. Maybe some of you are, are thinking about shark attacks or some of you are thinking about um, what they eat or some of you might be thinking about uh, how we affect sharks. But my goal is to, to help everyone understand the truth about sharks, about their biology and the cool things about them so that we can appreciate them and help to conserve them because they're super important. Um, just as plankton are really important <clears throat> from the bottom of the ocean up or the bottom of the food web, uh, sharks and these big predators are really important from the top down. So 
um, just to go into a little bit about what I do, I do a lot of tagging. And so the way that we can follow these animals when they're out in the ocean um, is to put electronic tags on them. So this tag is called an acoustic tag. And um, it basically goes on a little bit of a, a spear. And the idea, uh, there's this little illustration of it, um, is that when an animal has that tag on it and it swims around, that, that transmits to a base station. And then that base station can transmit the signal up to a satellite. So I can put a tag on a, a white shark off of Oregon and have a base station. And I could be home at my house and that shark, when it swims by the base station, the base station communicates to me and says that, hey, there's a white shark off of Newport. And so that's a good way that we start to understand some of the, the local movements of these animals. And you may ask, how do, we, um, how do we put these tags on animals? Well, this is how we do it. So this is, if you look at the screen here, there's a, um, a blue pole. And on the end of that is one of those tags. And one of the species that I work with um, is the manta ray. And this is a, a manta that I tagged just a few um, weeks ago uh, in the Indian Ocean. And this is a little bit different. Some animals I can tag from on, on the boat. And this is one I actually have to swim after. And if you're familiar with mantis, you'll know that they're not usually white. Uh, and the reason this one is white is because it's upside down looking at me. And so you can see its eyes looking up at me. So when, they're, when they have their, their belly down towards the ground, they can't see above them. And so this manta knew I was there, so it wanted to keep a close eye on me. So it swam away when I got close. But persistence pays off, and you'll see that it comes up again, and it'll look at me. And uh, you just have to be patient. And what you have to do is get within a few feet of the animal. You have that tag. And once the animal is distracted, it turns over. And that's the time that you can stick the tag into the back of the manta as we do there. And then that manta will swim around for the next few years with that tag on its back. And the idea is that I can look at the movements of those mantas um, throughout the Indian Ocean whenever they're, they're around one of these base stations that we've put in the water. The trick about that is that I have to have a base station in the water to hear it. So we have a few different techniques that we use if we don't have a base station. So this is what we call a satellite tag. And a satellite tag is basically an onboard computer. And so we put this on the animal very similar way that I did with the manta there. Um, but instead of needing a base station, this will catalog all the information. So it's, it's basically like taking a recorder that will record wherever the animal goes over the next year of its life. Um, and this is, again, another little video that shows you how it works. And so you can see the tag on the back of this, this white shark. And after about a year, it'll pop up. And then it'll take all the information about where that shark has been and what it's been doing and transmit it up to a satellite. So for example, this one was off of Hawaii. It popped off and said, hey, the shark was off Hawaii. And then here's all the data. And so once I put the tag on, um, I can follow where the animal goes without actually having to be there and be with the animal for a year of its life. You might ask how we put these tags on. And similar to what we did with the acoustic tag is that this tag um, goes in with a dart, and this is a, a, a whale shark, again, from a few weeks ago in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and you'll remember from Jamie's talk a few minutes ago that whale sharks are um, pretty big, but there's obviously there's plankton that are bigger, and these are the biggest, one of the biggest fishes in the ocean, and they feed on plankton. So it's very closely related to the work that Jamie was talking about just a few minutes ago. And so to put the tag on the shark, you'll see it swimming by. You'll see some, some flippers kick in here for a second as we get positioned. And then you can see me running down or swimming down and putting a tag in, very similar to the way that I put the tag in the manta. Uh, and so for my job, I spend a lot of time in the water and underwater trying to put these tags on different animals. This is a, a different species. This is a, a blue marlin. Um, and very similarly, uh, we put the tag into the, the back of the animal and it goes right into the muscle. And you'll see this is me leaning over the side and the tag goes in, uh, and then we can release the animal, and that tag can stay on for the next year. Um, so it's a good way for us to understand what their movements are and what they're doing over a period of time when we can't be with them. So you might ask, well, what, is, what do we find out from these tags? So we get to learn about the animal's movements um, from the satellites, from the tags once they pop up. And so this is just a, a short video showing some of the animals that we've tagged off the West Coast. So you'll be familiar with that. That body of land there is um, California is right in the middle. We're a little bit north of that. And then all the lines that you see will be different species of animals um, that we've tagged and tracked across the oceans. So you see the, the big white lines there are white sharks. They move from California and Oregon all the way off to Hawaii and back. 
And so this was the first chance for us to really be able to follow animals into their environment to see what they're doing and where they're going. Otherwise, the only time that we could interact with them is when we caught them or when they washed up on our beaches. Another cool type of technology that I work with to understand more about their behavior is called biologging tags. <clears throat> and these are super cool because they allow us to recreate the movements and the behaviors and actually see what the animals are seeing underwater. So this, this tag has a lot of technology that you have in your, in your phone or in your computer or an iPad. So it has the, the camera that allows us to see things. It also has the accelerometers. And if you've ever looked at a, um, at a phone or an iPad, when you switch it, the angles of the iPad, the screen switches with you. And so those are accelerometers that are uh, basically reading the direction of Earth's gravity and able to, to make that picture so it's always upright when you're looking at it. And we use that same technology, we, we put it into a tag and then we put that on the animal. And that allows us to recreate the movement. So we can look at how an animal swims, we can look at its tail beat, we can see how fast it swims, and we can see how it interacts with other animals and other species in the water column. And so this is a tag that we have to put on um, uh, it has to be a really strong attachment, so we can't dart it in the same way that we put the other tags in. So this one actually has to clamp on, and this is a, a white shark that I clamped on in South Africa. Um, and you can see that the shark comes up <clears throat> next to the side of the boat. We coax it up, and it'll clamp it onto the dorsal fin of the shark, with the fin right on its back. And so for the next two weeks or so, that shark will have that tag on its back, recording everything it sees and does over that period of time. And this is what it looks like when the shark's swimming around. You can see that orange tag on its back. So when we get that tag back later on, I can see everything that that shark has seen throughout the, throughout the two weeks of its time. It also allows us to recreate the behaviors that those animals are doing. And one cool behavior uh, is how they interact with other species. And so this is an elephant seal that I tagged in California. Um, and the, the tag goes right on the back. It attaches to the fur. And then we release the animal and you can see the, the view, it's basically at the back of the head, there's the orange tag on the back of the animal. <clears throat> and we get to see once it, how it interacts with this environment. So how it uses the kelp forest and then how it interacts with other species. And so this is a harbor seal. Um, and it, if any of you have ever seen puppies or dogs play, it seems like that harbor seal is doing the same thing. It's got its sort of, it's got its flippers down and they look sort of curious at each other and they get pretty close and then they freak out. And so it's pretty cool. So we've never seen these two species interact underwater because we've never been underwater with them in the same way. So the cool biologging te technology that we have, these camera enabled tags have allowed us to recreate and to, or I guess allowed us to see how these animals are interacting with other species in their environment. They also allow us to recreate the movements. And so if you've ever seen a, a shark week or a video on YouTube of a shark jumping out of the water, it's crazy. So we, we have these animals that are maybe 4,000 pounds. They're the, you know, the weight of a, of a small car and they're accelerating. They're getting themselves going from a couple miles an hour up to about 25 miles per hour. And they're jumping out of the water, but we don't know how they do that. So these tags allow us to understand that better. What angle they start heading toward the surface when they see something and how fast they have to beat their tail. And so this is just a, a quick video of some of the data that we get from those tags. So from the accelerometers, those same things that are in your, your smartphone, we can create, we recreate the movement of these sharks and how fast they beat their tail, how they're turning in the water, and then how they get themselves up and out of the water and back down. So it's really cool cutting edge technology that we use, that I use to understand how animals are moving. So that's a little bit about what I do uh, here at Oregon State. And I always get questions up, up, about, well, you know, how did you get started in this and, and, and what was the first thing you did or where did, you know, where, you, where do you begin? So funny enough, I grew up right next to where Jamie grew up. So I grew up in the great state of Ohio up on Lake Erie. Uh, and, and similar to Jamie's question about um, just having this real love of, of the water and realizing that she just loved the ocean being on the water, I grew up uh, on the water every day on the Great Lakes. So Lake Erie, I, I grew up sailing. I was a lifeguard. And my family spent so much time on the water. I knew from that point that I really wanted to spend my life on and around the water, doing something that was, that was giving back to this, this incredible um, resource uh, that we had. And so for me, it was a really long uh, pathway to get from where I started in Ohio to where I am now. 
And this goes back to, I think, Jamie's response to the question about um, her internship and whether what the values of those. And, and, and Jamie really put it well. She said, when you have an opportunity to say yes, because that was what really allowed me to end up where I am. Because as I show a little bit of a timeline of, of sort of my progression through beginning my studies to now, that I had so many different opportunities that are really not terribly related to where I am right now, but um, they've got me to where I, where I am. And so I started my undergraduate work at Boston University, uh, and you'll see these little um, yellow lightning bolts of where the research was that I did, and the shark is gonna follow where I was based out of. So I was in Boston for a few years doing my undergrad, working on Nile perch, which is this predator-prey um, interaction that happens in Lake Victoria. Um, from there, I moved to Seattle, and I worked on plankton, of all things, um, very similar to Jamie, so understanding the, the relationship between water quality um, and plankton. And I, I, I use that as an opportunity to, to, to do uh, education uh, on a sailboat, which was pretty cool. Then I worked uh, in New England, uh, designing dis experimental uh, nets. So I was interested in conservation. So I thought, how can we, how can we protect species while still being able to harvest them? So we created uh, nets that were based on animal behavior. So it would use animal behavior to catch one animal, but not another. Um, from then, uh, I worked in commercial shark fisheries down with the University of Florida. And I moved over to um, University of California in Davis and did my PhD. And that's when I started working on, on uh, white sharks. I moved over to do a post uh, a postdoc, which is the basically the internship period after your PhD before you get a, a faculty job. Uh, and I started working there um, on sharks in the Galapagos, uh, as well as uh, hammerhead sharks in Mexico, uh, and then some other different species, actually terrestrial species around, just to get some more experience, more of that opportunity um, that Jamie spoke about. And I also did some some hammerhead work uh, over in Hawaii. And from there, I moved over to Stanford, and that's where I did a second postdoc. Uh, and that's when I got involved in a number of different projects, some projects on salmon sharks up in Alaska, um, other work uh, in the Indian Ocean, the things that the whale sharks and the manta rays that I showed you before. Um, and then from there, moved over here to, to Hatfield uh, into Oregon. And here I'm working on salmon sharks and white sharks, a uh, number of the other species that we have here off our coast. So as you can see, it was a really almost like a convoluted, a very um, non-straight pathway to get where I came, but I had opportunities to go internationally, I had an opportunity to study very different species, um, and many different opportunities in education and research during that time. And one thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, I've had some really cool opportunities to, to do different projects, you know, around the world, but um, I seem to have, my screen has frozen here. Uh, it's, if you are interested in, in marine biology and, and doing similar things to what I do, you don't have to be um, a, a person that goes into the field. You don't have to be someone who wants to get in the water and tag sharks or tag fish. There's so many different ways to be involved. So the work that I do involves um, electrical engineers. It, it involves um, aerospace engineers where we have a satellite up that's specifically for tracking animals and that needs certain people that can design the technology for it or do the coding for it. Um, we have product designers that do the shapes and the colors of different tags. Some of the work that I do is electrical engineering actually making the microchips that go into the tags. And so there's many different avenues. If you're not the person that wants to be on a boat, if you get seasick, if you are not excited about the ocean, there's so many ways to be involved in this type of work. And so I put this, this sort of collage of, of words up just to show just some of the ideas or some of the um, different areas of, of, of expertise that people that I collaborate with and that I rely on to do the work that I do. So whether you're an oceanographer or want to do computer programming, graphic design, there's still a place for you in this type of research, uh, even if what I do is not exactly um, your cup of tea. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take uh, any questions that you all have. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Taylor. And thank you for letting us all know there's ways we can get involved with sharks that aren't just tagging them and, and, and analyzing the data. So um, participants, go ahead and feel free and ask some questions through the Q&A box. I thank you wowed them so much, Taylor, that they 
forgot that they could uh, type some questions for you in the question box. I'll go ahead. Oh, here we go from Mike. We have, oops, from Mike. I've heard of the White Shark Cafe only a little. What do you know about it from the tags? So that's a great question. So one of the, the big things that I study is the White Shark Cafe. So for those of you that aren't familiar, the white sharks that are on our coast are here seasonally. So they're only here maybe late summer to early fall. And then they migrate offshore to this spot in the middle of the Pacific, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and they spend about half their life out there and then they come back every year. And so it's this place that we don't really understand yet. We're trying to figure out why this massive predator would go from our coastline, which has tons of food and tons of resources to a place that's like a desert. And I spent uh, about a month a year and a half ago out in the cafe, trying to understand the, the biology uh, and the ecology of that region. And very similar to the work that, um, that Jamie was describing earlier is that we collected plankton samples, we collected water samples to understand what's happening with the chemistry, and we're still working on that. But it turns out that the cafe is this really interesting resource that is, um, it, it, normally the way that we understand offshore areas is we have satellites and they tell us what's going on there. But it's a very unique place that all of the productivity, the, the plankton and things are down deeper so we can't see them from the satellites. So the sharks have shown us this really unique spot on our globe that we didn't know existed from all of our technologies until we followed the animals to show us what was important to them. And so I'm hoping in the next few months that we'll have some research that's coming out that's talking more about what they're doing out there uh, and why they're out there. So that was a great question, Mike. Thank you, Taylor. And of course, we must ask you, so thank you, Shay. What is your favorite shark? Shay, that is, a, that is an unfair question because <laughs> all of them are super awesome. Um, I, I spent most of my time studying white sharks, and so I know their behaviors. And so for me, they're the most interesting because they do, they, they're so incredibly, um, complex with where they go and how their behavior and how they interact with each other, how they interact with their environment. So they are my favorite, but that's because I know, know the most about them. Um, but there are so many incredible uh, species of sharks from the really small lantern sharks that are about this big to giant whale sharks and mega mounts and everything in between. All right, thank you, Taylor. And a question from Hannah, have you worked with any cetaceans? And if you want to work with different whales and dolphins, what type of research would you recommend? So that's a great question. I have only worked with cetaceans uh, peripherally. So uh, in other projects that I've done, um, they've been, uh, I've worked with other researchers that that's their focus. Um, but studying large charismatic species is all, it's all very similar. Um, and it is, uh, to, to be totally honest, it is very difficult to have those opportunities um, to study them, but that doesn't mean that it's not possible. Uh, what it means is that um, you, I guess, have to be willing to, um, as Jamie and I have both said, take those opportunities. And so put the time in, make sure you have internship and experience, take the opportunities that you have to interact with someone who does pin a better cetacean work. Um, you know, get to know the species that are in your local area if, if you're along the coast um, and, and make yourself available so that if an opportunity comes, comes around, you can take that and you can show that you are invested, that you are interested. Don't, I guess, don't be a person that, that says, I'm excited about blue whales. Be a person that says, I'm excited about blue whales because of, and then um, you know, talk about something that really fascinates you rather than just say that, yeah, they're, they're cool. But if the more that you can understand them, the more that you've experienced them and show that you um, are invested in that topic, um, the more likely it is that you are, like Jamie said, going to pop onto the top of that pile. So that can be, that's, I guess, my, my, my best recommendation. Great, Taylor. And I just want to squeeze in one more question because it's a really good one from Eli. When you're studying in another country or state, do you buy a house and live there or is it more like staying in a hotel or on the ship? That's a great question. And it depends, it depends on the type of research that you do. So if you are doing long-term projects somewhere, um, often it, uh, I do know researchers that have, that have actually purchased properties or purchased a place to stay because you need to keep your equipment, you set up a lab, 
or it's a, a spot that you use quite often. For most of the work that I do, um, we will go and stay places for short periods of time. A lot of it's boat-based, similar to Jamie's, where you're on a research vessel for a month or two, and then you're based from there onto the, um, uh, onto the different sites. So it really depends on the type of research that you're doing and where you're doing it. The other thing is that you partner with collaborators other places. So I'd work with a researcher that is in Ecuador at the Galapagos, and so I would use their facilities and stay at their their um, their accommodations uh, rather than have to have my own. And then when they wanted to come do research here, I would put them up either at my house or somewhere that we had here. So you do a lot of sharing um, between uh, research projects and collaborators as well. Fantastic, Taylor. So unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. If you have not been able to type your question for either of our researchers, feel free to type it in the question and answer box now. We will do our best to work with our presenters to answer as many of these unanswered questions as we can. And then we will post those questions and answers along with the recording on our Career Day website. So be sure to check back. Before you go, we would love your feedback via a quick survey. So Kate is going to be dropping the link that you see on this slide here into the chat box, which note the chat box is separate from the question and answer box. So you can either click on the link in the chat box or copy and paste the link into your browser. So we thank you in advance for your input. We also encourage you to register for our upcoming webinars in May. We are happy to announce that we'll be hosting a webinar every Wednesday in May at 4 p.m. Pacific time. So Kate, if you can drop a link to our Career Day website in the chat window, again, you can either click the link or copy and paste the link into your web browser. Coming up next week on May 6th, we'll be hearing from Dr. Shay Steingas, who works with marine mammals. So maybe bring that cetacean question to that webinar next week. And we'll also be hearing from Alyssa Johnson, who works aboard the NOAA ship Fairweather and uses sound to map images and, or paint images of the seafloor. So check out our Career Day website for more information and registration, and we hope to see you there. So this concludes the Careers and in Science Investigation webinar. Thank you again to our presenters for their thrilling presentations, and thank you participants for joining us. Have a great evening. <laughs>